Hello, Keith Kaiser here, and we're looking at the book of Acts. We're doing studies in the book of Acts, and today we're at Acts 12, and we pick up at verse 12. Acts 12 and verse 12. So when he had considered this, that's Peter. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It was his angel. It is his angel. Verse 16. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. So we'll see what he says after that. But... I think this is kind of amusing in a certain way that Peter was divinely released from his chains and there was an angelic jailbreak here that the Lord sent in the heavenly special forces to break Peter out. Of course, it only took one angel to keep any of the guards from knowing what was happening, keeping any of the bars or doors or gates from hindering Peter's progress out of incarceration. And the Lord freed him through that angel. Now he's in the street and he comes to Mary's house. She's the mother of John Mark, who's later going to be more prominent in chapter 13 when Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey. And still later, he's going to be used of the Lord to write the second gospel, the gospel according to Mark. And church history tells us he was latterly a great helper to Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, uh, here was a place where the church was known to gather. In the first century, they didn't normally have a designated building where the church met. Uh, we will read later in the missionary journeys of Paul in Corinth and at Ephesus and other places, there were sometimes rented buildings used or rented rooms. And yet very often the churches met in houses as we see here, there was a prayer meeting going on. We already read earlier that constant prayer, verse 5 says constant prayer was offered to God for Peter by the church. So this prayer meeting is going on and Peter apparently knows there's believers gathered there. And so he's standing outside the door knocking and the servant or a girl rather named Rhoda, this is her only appearance in the scripture, she goes to the door and she recognizes his voice. But because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Now, again, there's a tremendous mark of historicity here. The reality that we can tell that this isn't some made up story, but this is an actual occurrence because it's so true to life. You can imagine a young girl. We don't know precisely how old she was. But she goes and realizes Peter's outside. You know, here they've been praying for him. He's in prison. He's probably on death row. They're equivalent of death row anyway, because James has recently been killed. And now Herod's fixing to do the same thing to Peter. And so she's just tremendously joyful, so joyful. She loses uh, her awareness of the situation and doesn't let Peter in. And here's the man who gates of prisons can't hold him in because the angel supernaturally opens them. And yet he's left outside the house. He can't get in. And I think that's ironic and funny at the same time. But so true to life because sometimes God does something so wonderful. Somebody you've prayed for and maybe you despaired of them ever repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus. And then they get saved. And as an older brother used to say, they get saved real good. You say, man, there's a change in this person. As the hymn writer said, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Or maybe there's somebody you thought was going to die and all the indicators were against them. And yet the Lord raises them back up to health and you're just astonished. They go on to live for a great deal longer in time. I mean, sometimes the Lord does something and surprises us and, and we're so joyful, uh, we just don't know how to react. And that was rather like this. But you notice the church wasn't expecting angels behind every tree or every rock or expecting miracles every day, as uh, many people would try to tell us today. But they said, verse 15, you're beside yourself. I mean, they knew that prisons are 
kept guarded, that doors that are locked stay locked unless the jailer opens them, that if someone's in chains, they remain in chains till their guards remove those chains. And in Peter's case, everybody expected him to be carried forth to trial and maybe to be executed, but they were praying. And sometimes we pray and imagine that we're astonished when the Lord answers our prayer, or maybe we're astonished at how the Lord answers our prayer. That's why it's good when you pray not to dictate to the Lord precisely how he should do something, you know, like, Lord, if you'd only do this or that or the other thing specifically, it's better to say, Lord, your will be done. We know you want this person saved, or we know that you're able to heal this person, or we know you're able to provide this need, or we know you're able to grant wisdom and you tell us to ask of you, you give to all men liberally and abrade not. And so we're doing that. We're following your word, we're obeying it, and we're looking you in faith. But at the end of the day, Lord, you do it the way you want to do it. Thy, way, thy will be done. And that's better to leave it in the Lord's hands and to let him give us guidance and, and open and shut doors and so forth. But Peter, bless his heart, verse 16, he continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, what a tremendous surprise. There's Peter. We've just been praying for him. And lo, here he stands. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent. Now, that's kind of a trope in ancient literature. When you have somebody that's about to make a speech, they beckon with the hand. And you'll see Paul doing it later in Acts chapter 21, for example. And there's other uh, places where someone who's going to make an oration or a speech or a sermon often does that. So he beckons with the hand and he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Isn't that wonderful? And the first comments aren't about himself. Well, you know, I was suffering greatly uh, there in the prison. And do you want to see my scars from the fetters and the shackles and, and the marks they made on me? Or do you know how nasty it was to try to sleep being chained up to these guards? No, his first remarks are about the Lord. He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. So the Lord used an angel, but he looks behind the agent, so to speak, to the one who inspired the activity, to the one who commanded that angel to come and do what he did. He said, the Lord brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. Now, lest you're confused because you say, wait a minute, I thought James was killed earlier in the chapter. Yes, he was. That was James, the son of Zebedee. Uh, just like in our time, more than one person has the same first name. This is not James, the son of, Je of Zebedee, and this is James, who is a prominent Christian at Jerusalem, and we'll see him take a leading part in Acts 15, for example. And he would be the half-brother of the Lord. And many people think that he's the writer of the epistle to James. Of course, the Holy Spirit inspired it, but they think that the Holy Spirit used this James as the penman. And it could very well be, of course. I, I lean that way myself. But he says, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So now they have uh, the great privilege of going and talking about the good thing the Lord had done. Peter comes and gives a report and they're to go and tell others about it, to tell James and the brethren specifically. And he goes to another place. But look at verse 18. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. Again, that's humorous. I mean, you can imagine there's no small stir. You know, it's like them losing Al Capone from Alcatraz or losing John Dillinger or somebody else. I mean, here's your most wanted criminal, you know, and suddenly he's not there. My grandfathers, both of them, my paternal and maternal grandfathers, were each prison guards at certain points in their careers. They both worked at the same penitentiary and yet uh, they were there at different times. They didn't know one another and didn't overlap in that job. But one of them, my mother's father, uh, guarded a very notable prisoner named Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton was a very famous bank robber. And apparently he was a dapper crook. He was well-dressed and he was well-spoken and polite. And so they called him Slick Willie. And Willie Sutton was also known for his ability to break out of prison. And he did that multiple times. He broke out of Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, for example, although he only remained at large a few hours 
uh, because as you said, he looked back and he saw his muddy footprints coming out of the tunnel that other inmates had dug. They came through that tunnel and they were all muddy. So he knew it was only a matter of time. And sure enough, they caught him and reincarcerated him. And in one of the later institutions where he was housed, my grandfather guarded him and got to know him a little bit. But imagine, you know, being one of those guards when a jailbreak happens. That's a, a disquieting feeling for the guards and they would be upset. And what's more, their lives were in jeopardy. Verse 19, but when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. I mean, here they say, well, we couldn't help it. You know, we were there chained to him. He was sleeping. And the next thing we wake up in the morning and he's gone. And the guards at the doors and the gates. And he goes past these guard posts and no one sees him. No one stops him. No one is able to hinder this. Herod thinks, you know, you've totally fallen down on the job. You've done a terrible job. I'm going to execute you for your poor performance. Now, this, of course, makes me think of the guards that were posted at the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that Pilate said, you have a guard, go and make the tomb as secure as you are able. And tombs of that cave sort normally had stones rolled across the entrance. There's other types that the archaeologists have found in Judea and other parts of Israel. And they rolled that stone there and they put a seal on it saying, that that was sealed by the authority of the governing powers, that is. And they put an armed guard there so that none of his disciples could steal his body. Now, of course, none of the disciples were in shape for any daring do. I mean, they were so disconsolate and depressed and crestfallen and utterly shaken by the death of the Lord Jesus. As you can get some idea from Luke 24, when you read the Lord's conversation incognito, with the two on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him, and yet they're so sad. They're so bummed out about what happened because everything they thought they thought they thought they knew about the Lord Jesus seems to have been thwarted. Like now he's dead. So what's the hope in that? And even the report of the empty tomb seems to them incredible. Like they can't believe that the Lord Jesus has really risen, even though he had been telling his disciples right the way along that he was going to rise again from the dead on the third day. Now, if it were so that the body of the Lord Jesus was taken away by disciples or somebody else, uh, let's assume that the guards permitted that to happen. Let's assume that they fell asleep. <laughs> you know, the earliest tradition about that empty tomb uh, that was discussed on the part of the enemies was, if this comes to the ears of the governor, they say in Matthew 28, uh, will make you secure. And they paid the guards to give the story that his body was stolen. Now, if the body of Jesus of Nazareth had been stolen, and in short order, this led to his apostles going and preaching that Christ had risen and making this tremendous claim for the gospel, would not the authorities have come back, like Pilate, for example, would he not have come back and executed those soldiers and said, like Herod did here, you've done tremendous malfeasance. You've dereliction of duty. You've not done a good job. You let them abscond with the body of Jesus Christ. Ne never mind that that is so improbable. What really happened is that the Lord rose again, that the tomb could not keep him. That the bands of death themselves were not able to hold him, as Peter said in Acts 2. And that these soldiers were so frightened by the earthquake and the angel that descended to roll back the stone and demonstrate the empty tomb, that they lay on the ground like dead men. It wasn't any kind of attack or any subterfuge on the part of an ally of Jesus of Nazareth. There wasn't a believer coming and stealing the body. The only explanation that holds any water from the historicity of the accounts, from the historical evidence that we have, evidence of eyewitnesses, is that the Lord Jesus Christ truly rose again from the dead. And if he's risen again from the dead, that has tremendous implications, of course. That means he's true. That means he's exactly who he said he was, that he is the Messiah, that God didn't allow him to see corruption, but he raised him from the dead, that he's been justified, vindicated, in other words, 
that all those who said he was a blasphemer, he's not a blasphemer. Every word he said was true. He was God incarnate. And just as he proclaimed his death and resurrection beforehand, he also has told us he's coming again. Well, so he is, my friend, and you better be ready. Because just as the resurrection is true, just as the tomb is empty, and whether you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem today, or you go to the garden tomb outside the East Jerusalem bus station, or you think it was some other place, no one has found the body of Jesus. No one can produce the body. Issue your writ of habeas corpus, there won't be a corpus. The corpus has been raised and the Lord has ascended up to glory only after showing himself alive by many infallible proofs, as Acts 1 says. And that's why over and over and over again, the apostles preach that Christ has risen because as he has risen, so his people are going to rise. He said, because I live, ye shall live also in John 14. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20 puts it this way. But now has Christ risen, the first fruits of them that sleep. So he's not the last fruits. He's not the end of the harvest. He's the beginning of a brand new harvest that's going to be a mighty harvest. Hebrews 2 says he's bringing many sons to glory. And I hope you're among that company. You can be just for the asking. If you'll turn from your sin and self and say, Lord, save me a sinner. Lord, transform me. Make me a new creature in Christ Jesus, and I'll follow you. And the Lord says he'll make you his own, and he will come again and receive you to himself, that where you are, uh, that where he is, rather, there you will be also. So may you turn to the Lord Jesus today, because the alternative is, if you die without Christ, or if you're here when he comes back in judgment, you'll be overtaken by wrath. The judgment of God, his holy and just judgment will pass upon you. And that will send you out of God's presence into outer darkness, into the lake of fire for eternity. God doesn't want that for you. He's not willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 says. And he desires all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 says. So turn to the Lord Jesus, believe on him while he may be found. Thank you for listening.